What's up, marketing maniacs? And welcome back to another episode of From Startup to Wunderbrand, your ultimate BFF in the wide world of digital marketing. Join me, your host, Nicholas Kuhner, spilling the beans on the juiciest trends and hottest tips to up your marketing game. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the exciting world of digital marketing and brands with me, Nicholas Kuna, your host at From Startup to Wunderbrand. And today we're not talking about startups, but we are talking about a Wunderkind, and his name is Jamie Ryder, and he's a copywriter. So we're going to be talking about his new book that has just come out, and we're also going to talk a little bit about Japanese culture, which I'm sure a lot of you are interested. So, Jamie, great to have you with us today. Well, thanks for the lovely introduction, Nicholas. I've never been called a Wonderkeen before, but I'll take it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it goes along with our brand. You are the founder of Stoic Athenium. Stoic Athenium is a UK-based copywriting company that blends Jamie's interest in philosophy with business. He's focused on helping businesses in tech, mental health, and property share their philosophies through the written word and understanding ethical marketing. So let's get into the marketing side, side of it first before we get into your book. You're talking about ethical marketing. That's one. So let's just park that. But you're a copywriter. Just tell me what life is as a copywriter since the introduction of ChatGPT. Yeah, well, obviously, that is the elephant in the room in a lot of marketing circles, but particularly in the world of copy, you're going to get lots of differing opinions and mine really is it comes down to a blend of balance. I mean, I think AI is here, it's inevitable, and it's certainly a tool that can help to do like research and help with certain writing up to a point. But to me, copywriting is ultimately about ideas. And I think humans are always going to be those idea generators. You can have like a lot of fun playing around with like different algorithms, perhaps in chat GPT, but it's only one very small cog in a much wider machine i think so you do need that balance but equally you can learn about it try to learn as much as it advances but also <laughs> fall back on that idea that you are the one with the ideas and you do need to talk to the people who can research who can write and who can bring everything together at the same time one other issue i want to talk to you about is can you spot an ai written piece of copy versus a human generated piece of copy jamie hmm. me personally it's a very interesting take i mean what i like about copy generally and um i've learned this from copywriters who know a hell of a lot more than about it than i do but i think it really comes down to rhythm at the end of the day and what i mean by that is like the tone of voice that you might see if you're reading something that might just seem like quite a bland or staccato perhaps but with somebody who's actually naturally written. I don't know, it's a very like nebulous thing, at least for me, but I like to think, oh, I can pick that up if somebody's written it by a human. There's like some authenticity there. It's a bit of an intangible thing, but I just get that like in an instinctual feeling. It totally is instinctual. And it's not just professionals like yourself who can pick up that something's been written by AI. There's been a bit of a palaver here in Norway where a comedian did an entire view, uh, interview with a journalist through AI and the journalist got um, busted by not realizing that this was actually a complete AI-driven interview. And I think we've got quite good bullshit filters, actually. You can spot something that is not authentic and, as you said, I think it's that rhythm. It's a good way of explaining that issue. So, yeah, I think there's still space for copywriters. And, you know, I'm in the process of writing two operas or librettos for operas. And I used a wonderful new program, AI program called O.com. And I typed in, I said, okay, I want to do the opera in the style of Wagner. And I wanted to have, you know, melancholy notes. And boom, out came a beautiful piece of <laughs> beautiful piece of music with obviously the lyrics were slightly suspect and the and the flow and that was off but it was very it was very very 
compelling as a starting point, as a research point in terms of, okay, what, what can it sound like? And the problem, and you touched on it, is the rhythm is just completely off. The brakes on the wrong point, that doesn't flow. And that's why AI is going to be a great resource for just pulling together interesting different techniques and sounds and styles. And then it's up, for, up to the specialists like yourself to pull that together. Ethical marketing. So let's talk about some of the copywriting that you do, because obviously copywriters specialize in, there are copywriters who specialize in particular areas versus just being general copywriters. So maybe talk through some of the sort of specializations that you've got. Yeah, absolutely. One of my initiatives that I really like is mental health, and that is a very complex field in itself. I like to look at things like the messaging of a business, because particularly in the UK, there's this concept called well-being washing, where people might claim to want to be perceived to help their employees or outwardly in their marketing messaging. It seems that way, but internally, it is all purely for show. It's all flash. There's no substance. So having that alignment with values and stakeholder versus shareholder and all that aligned in the messaging internally and externally is so important, at least to me. I think copywriting is a really valuable thing to have there. And philosophy for me has really been that guiding point of view where I take different philosophical school of thoughts when I'm in that research phase and trying to look at it from different ways, particularly with the philosophy of stoicism really helps me try to focus on the research in a uh, specific way but then i might also blend in a bit of healthy skepticism as well i like i'll look at things from multiple angles i'll question somebody i'll question somebody else and then i'll suspend my judgment for a little bit i'll go away do more research and then come back before i even start writing and i think that is the key point of what great copy ultimately will be it's the research before anything gets written yeah and I suppose it needs to percolate in your head a little bit before you can necessarily put it down on paper. You talk about uh, philosophy and oh, I'm sure all of the other reading that you've done, and that's all sitting in the back of your head somewhere, just waiting to be pulled together into a nice um, a new piece of copy. So I suppose that brings us into the, the next section, which is talking about your book, which is called Japanese Fighting Heroes. You look like somebody who is not Japanese. So what got you into Japanese fighting heroes? And uh, how many years did you spend in Japan studying with great masters? Well, first, well spotted, Nicholas. I'm very much not Japanese. <laughs> I'm a northern Mancunian in the UK in Manchester, where I'm from. So my actual background is I've always been fascinated by Japanese culture since I was a kid. I really like grew up with the 90s anime in Japan and honestly I've still yet to have gone to Japan but my actual process for that was if I can't go to Japan yet I'll bring it to me and that led me to actually creating a magazine called Yamato magazine in 2019 because it was really influenced by the culture it's really like having its moment in the UK in particular and I wanted to help raise more awareness of it through the food the drink and the history and that is what led me to create the magazine. So a couple of years into that, I started writing about the food and the drink, and then a publisher actually got in touch with me, having seen the magazine and asked if I wanted to write the book. So I, th I think to a certain extent, you can see that as an extension of marketing, somebody who is writing about a subject that they are passionate about, not really having any sort of outcome beyond just writing about what they believe in, and then other people will read it and they might pick up a turn, you might get an opportunity out of it. And that was like really fun to, discover that and Japanese fighting heroes then became something of character studies of like larger than life figures from Japan, like the samurai, like the ninjas, the geishas, but people who have like really lived interesting lives across like the whole of the history of Japan, but how we can also internalize what they led and how they lived their lives practically in today's world, but also the things that we might not be able to take away from them as well. So there's a lot of different things going on with the book, but it was really fun to write at the end of the day. So I'm going to talk about some chapters. The, uh, chapter one is, or in the introduction, you've got the Japanese Hercules and the meaning of strength, the lightning lord and the legend of the samurai, a bad number and the magic of sake. On that first one, the Japanese Hercules and the meaning of strength, I mean, this is very important sort of 
understanding cross-cultural cross differences because strength in one country or one culture might me mean something completely different in another. Yeah, indeed. And that was very deliberate for me when actually writing that chapter, because when I was actually planning out the book, I was looking for like analogous concepts that I could kind of look in the West and then compare it to that Eastern perspective just to blend these cultures together. And I settled on Hercules as that big Western figure who is very classically known for his strength and his courage. And then in Japanese uh, culture, we have Kintaro, who is that like Herculean figure. They do have a lot of similarities that I found based on my research and looking at Kintaro as the Japanese golden boy, in essence, his story was fascinating and how he like bled into other like legends with other samurai as well, similar to the second chapter with the Lightning Lord and how his life was really celebrated by a lot of the ancient Japanese, but is still well known today for the perspective of like a children's tale as well. So there's a lot of different levels to Kintaro's life. There's another famous bit of writing on Japanese culture coming out of the UK, and, but that was over a hundred years ago. I think it's the Mikado, Gilbert and Sullivan. And it's amazing how J Japanese culture and design and art and thinking has sort of influenced, it was been very highly praised in sort of Britain since the Meiji era when it opened up to the West. So it'd be interesting to look back at the initial thinking of what British thinking of what Japan is versus, versus now with, like you said, all this anime and all of these stories. Is there a favorite story of yours in the book that we could mention to folks that they have to read that really sort of stood out for you? Yeah, absolutely. There are actually two chapters in the book that were really personal to me when I was writing them. And the first is about the last great uh, Japanese ukiyo-e master, a particular form of woodblock printing that was very famous in historical Japan called the uh, Yoshitoshi. He was known as the last great master of that art form and also the father of Japanese short stories, Rinosuke Akutagawa, who had a very interesting life, but a very short life tragically because of his mental health and the various difficulties that he went through. But similar to Yoshitoshi, his mental health was very categorized by his pursuit of trying to be as creative as possible, similar with Akutagawa. And they were like, machines of creating these really wonderful images, these ideas, these stories that even last today. But it was really like counterbalance with the, their tumultuous personal lives and how they had to be creative at cost of everything else in their lives. And when I was writing about their lives, it really made me think about how creativity in any format can be a double-edged sword. Some creators will want to dedicate everything that they can to it at the expense of their, you know, their family, sometimes their personal life, and they might not even be aware of it. So I think that is something to be aware of in one context, but also creativity is that pursuit of a creative balm. It's something we want to do to express ourselves. I was just really struck by that dichotomy when I was writing about these figures. It would be interesting in a hundred years when people write about Michael Jackson and folks like that who sort of died young or Marilyn Manson, uh, not Marilyn Manson, <laughs> Marilyn Monroe in terms of a, a similar type of concept. Now, great. You've done your first book. I'm sure there's a second one in the making as well. I see you talk about sake quite a bit. And I noticed that in your introduction, you say thank you to one of the folks from, let me have a look over here, Tengu Sake. And I've just completed a, a big project with J Fudo, which is a big Japanese trade company. And we did a huge campaign with The Spectator in London to promote all sorts of different, who knew there were all these different types of sake. I thought it was just one type and it uh, just needs to be warm and you drink it when you're having sushi or Chinese food. Yeah, I mean, it's such a fascinating uh, world that, and for context, I did like some qualifications in sake with the founder of Tengu Sake, Oliver, he was great. And that really tied into Yamato magazine and really furthered my interest in celebrating the culture in the UK too. Do you have a favorite sake? I mean, it really depends on the day and the, <laughs> the time and the mood, but category wise, I mean, Junmai Dai Ginjo, the really premium level stuff is great. I mean, Desai, 23 is always a great intro level sake that I like to recommend to people because it's really clean and very like white wine-esque if you like those kind of floral notes. But then I do like the kind of weird complex stuff like age sake koshu, which is a whole of the ball game. 
There's a huge potential, I think, for writing on sake, especially in the UK market, because one of the problems I felt they had is that they're trying to promote 40 different types of sake for 10 different regions, polished, unpolished, it, and it's too much to start with. You know, when folks drink wine, they want white wine and red wine. So they know they're two, and sparkling wine, those are the three types. Then only you go into countries, so I would like a, a Burgundy. Okay, so no Burgundy, or well, I know something from Yarra Valley. So very specific regions that are very easy to pronounce and easy to understand. Then you can go and then once you've sort of, your <clears throat> palate is a bit more sophisticated, then you can go and find all these interesting things. So I think there's definitely potential to write, and maybe your next book can be on sake culture and writing about all of these interesting, very old sake breweries in Japan. Ah, well, spoiler, I am working on a project <laughs> that might involve a little bit of that, but to be continued that. Ah, okay. So I went the cats out the bag. So from a marketing perspective, I've been to your website. It's obviously a copywriter's website, not a designer's website, because you've got lots of, <laughs> lots of content on there and it's not very picture rich, but it goes into some of obviously your work as a copywriter and an author talk to me about some of the challenges that you've had marketing and promoting this book does the publisher do it all or is there some onus on you as the author to work on the marketing as well and what have you done yeah absolutely and it's important to be completely transparent about this for any writer out there i mean just going all the way back to when i first started writing i think we all might start off with like this really romantic notion that's like, yeah, I want to write a book and it's going to be great. And, you know, you just assume that people will buy it. Oh, no, 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 no. You do have to, you know, actually contribute to writing it. But you're also your own marketer, your own seller. You've got everything balanced out with that. But having written for quite a long time now and with this particular project, it's been great that my publisher has been uh, marketing it themselves. But of course, mm -hmm. I've had to do my own legwork to get it out there in a few formats. And it's been out a couple of months now. And it's been interesting just to see what has worked and what hasn't. But for me, what I like to do is just test ideas and say, I've done this and maybe it's not worked, but great. I know what doesn't work. I'll move on to the next thing. Webinars have been really interesting just to get people in and to say, oh, I've got this topic. Obviously, that can be like a catch-22 sometimes when you don't know who's going to show up. But, you know, as the phrase goes, the show must go on and you just deal with it. And sometimes that can be quite fun, actually, when you do get like a little intimate circle of people who might actually pay more attention to what you're talking about. So in this marketing campaign for this current book, it's been really interesting to see what's worked and what hasn't and what I can take away into the next one. And I suppose it's quite an expensive exercise as well, because marketing isn't free. I mean, there, there are some free activities you can do, press releases and activities like that. But to make money, you need to spend money. Yeah, indeed. And that really helps in that philosophical lens. Again, you know, stoicism is like a great resiliency tool. And talking about that kind of thing as well, it's quite interesting when I look at like those philosophical concepts in different writing contexts, because as a writer, you have to be engaged with what you're doing. So that helps me put myself out there. But then I might go back into a philosophy called Epicureanism, where it's like, right, I, that teaches you to step away and to live unseen. And that is great in a copywriting sense, because all I have to really focus on is the writing aspect. The brand is the one that is out there then. So I'm more in the background and I do find switching those hats around to be very useful in various contexts. How would you define the success for your book? Because I think this is quite important when one is writing. It's either to make cash money and then you'll write something on the Kardashians or about uh, King Charles or something. This is a slightly more niche market, I guess. Have you set yourself certain goals to hit in terms of units that you want to sell by a certain amount of time or clicks in your website or amount of followers because the book is one aspect it can also help you market yourself for your other things like writing articles or doing workshops or talks about this particular subject is the book the money maker or is it the accoutrements around it yeah great question that and i've really thought about this process i mean the small goals that I've set for myself originally was I was focused on like the Amazon algorithm because that's a whole thing in itself. And I was like, right, 
obviously you are assigned a category and you want to test like how quickly it can go up and down. I looked at my categories and my main focus was just to see if it can crack the top 10 of the category that I was put in. I've achieved that goal and that was great. Secondly, I wanted to put myself out there in different talks to say, this is a topic I want to talk about, like what is the reaction from that? And that will also feed into the uh, live event that I eventually do too. And thirdly, like the main marker of it is if people will actually review it themselves and actually give me their honest feedback, then that's great. I have recently had a review for the book from the Japan Society of the UK and, and that was just honest and that, that was great. Like you can't, what I have learned is you can send out books for review, but it will ultimately be up to that person if they want to review and you get their thoughts straight away and that's great. But really what I'm focused on the most is just being able to write topics that I love. And if my publisher as well wants me to continue to write about subjects that resonate with other people, then so much the better. But my life and how I identify myself will always be as a writer. And these projects just continue to help me build momentum in various contexts, Nicholas. We were chatting a little bit earlier before we started about the Rest is History podcast. And the we've there's obviously Tom Holland and the other chap. And he writes a whole bunch of children's books based on historical figures. In terms of this book, if one goes to the chapters, there's a whole bunch of really nice potentials for stories for children. So bringing these Japanese stories to a brand new market in a fun and engaging way. So not to sort of give you more work, but there, <laughs> there might be some nice opportunities there as well for writing children's books, explaining some of these ancient Japanese stories as well. No, yeah, that is really interesting. Yeah. And again, it's fascinating, like how that sort of childlike wonder of Japanese culture works with things like Kintaro, like a lovely story also in the book about Urashima Taro, who it really deals with that aspect of looking at what time means to different people and how we need to make the most of our time. But stuff like that was being told like hundreds and thousands of years ago, but it's still so applicable to the modern era too. Exactly. So Jamie, where can folks buy this book? You can go to Amazon UK to find Japanese fighting heroes. You can also find it through my publisher, Pen and Swords Books and Pen and Sword History. Cool. I'll put a link down as well. And if folks want to get in touch with you for your marketing or your your copywriting prowess. You can find me at stoicathenium.com or if you are more interested in learning more about my Japanese slant on things, you can go to yamatomagazine.home.blog. Great. So I'll put all of those links in the description for those of you who are interested in some Japanese literary heroes. Jamie, it's been fascinating chatting to you. I hope the book stays in that top 10 and gets into other top 10s as well. I look forward to reading the full book. I've gone through a couple of chapters and I'm looking forward to working my way through the rest. Thanks for your time. Well, thank you, Nicholas. It's been a great conversation. I'm glad we've established that. Number one, I'm definitely not Japanese. And secondly, <laughs> that we can have a really open conversation about marketing techniques that can work and things that don't. And hopefully people can take that away when they listen to this episode. My last takeaway is that at least you pronounced athen athen Athenium differently as well from the beginning of the episode. So that makes me not feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Now, before we wrap up, don't forget to show some love for From Startup to Wunderbrand by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to help us grow, tell your friends, share on social media, and leave us a review. For those of you who want to dive a little bit deeper into the topic, join me on Twitter at Nick Kuna. Let's connect and chat about all things branding and digital. Until next time, 